I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Capital Allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions and securities discussed on this podcast. On today's show, we'll discuss another empty room, investing in Africa. The concept of an empty room is an opportunity ignored by most investors because they structurally can't invest or behaviorally don't want to. Investing in Africa follows earlier discussions about private equity in Venezuela and public equity in biotechnology as intriguing contrarian opportunities in the current market environment. My guests are Colin Smith and Farouk Mia, founders of All Africa Partners, a concentrated public equity fund they launched last year with backing by three of the most successful investors in the region. Our conversation covers their backgrounds and the opportunity set on the continent, including Africa's market size, investable countries, liquidity, market performance, businesses, valuations, and currencies. We then turn to All Africa's investment process across sourcing, due diligence, decision-making, trading, and portfolio construction. We close discussing risks in the region and lessons learned from Collins winning a silver medal at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Before we get going, about a third of all Capital Allocators listeners have already subscribed to private equity deals. If you're an allocator, a private equity manager, a banker, or just someone interested in learning what all the private equity fuss is about, this show is for you. Search for private equity deals on your favorite podcast player and subscribe. As soon as you do, you'll get a chance to listen to episode five featuring EQT in the most complex transaction we've discussed thus far. Please enjoy my conversation with Colin Smith and Farouk Mia. Colin, Farouk, thanks so much for doing this. Good to be here. Pleasure, thanks. I'm really keen to dive into what you're doing in Africa. Before we start, why don't we get into your backgrounds and and what got you here? Maybe I'll start. So uh, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. I came really to the UK as a teenager because I was good at going backwards down uh, rivers. So my single (laughs) claim to fame is that I'm an Olympic silver medalist in, in rowing. And that was the reason why I left Zimbabwe as a teenager and went to the UK been fascinated by stock markets for as long as I can remember watching gold and tobacco prices on the screen in Zimbabwe as a kid and not really understanding what any of that meant, but but knowing that I was fascinated by it. And, you know, when I finally hung up my oars and set off into the real world, um, I started off first in a stock market gaming business and then went into traditional equity analysis roles and finally ended up just focused on, on Africa from 2016 onwards. So that's the short version of how I ended up here. No Olympic medals on my side, Ted, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, like most of us. Um, but uh, in terms of heritage, my family is of Bangladeshi heritage. My parents moved to the UK in the 70s, but I was born and raised in the UK. And a bit more of a traditional background maybe than Collins. So since graduating, studying economics at Cambridge, all I've covered is public equities. So initially based out of London, covering European equities, and then an opportunity arose to move to the Middle East. It's supposed to be a kind of secondment. And as most of these secondments turn out, from two years, it became 10 years based in Saudi of all places, where initially I was building out our institutional equities business, and then on the buy side, doing MENA investments. And then for personal reasons, I wanted to move back to the UK, and our predecessor firm, Blakeney, was looking to hire. But I guess very much in my DNA is the kind of emerging market component. So Bangladesh is still very important. Majority of my extended family are still based in Bangladesh. The Middle East where I was based is still predominantly emerging market in terms of trades. And obviously, Africa is probably the most exciting emerging marketplace for us. So the attraction is kind of a common theme, Bangladesh, Africa, and Middle East. Colin, I have to ask, Zimbabwe sometimes gets synonymous with hyperinflation. Right. And would love to hear a little bit of your perspective from going up in Zimbabwe of macroeconomics and how it impacts how you think. 
Well, I mean, the first thing I guess I'd say is nobody can ever say we're not going to take currency risk seriously because I've seen the very, very worst of it and not just the sort of 2000 to 2008 period in Zimbabwe, but even more recently than that. You know, I've really seen how government policy can be very, very destructive to an economy. So we're very, very aware of that. But Ted, you know, I left Zimbabwe in 2000 and my father gave me then 200 Zimbabwe dollars, which was at the time the most money I'd ever held in cash as a teenager. It was worth about 50 pounds. I've still got those two $100 Zimbabwe notes pinned on my wall now next to two $100 trillion notes that were printed eight years later. So we really sort of get that. And as Miles Morland, Blakeney's founder says, you know, politics can still lead economics in many African countries. And I think that experience helps us. We should be fearful of some of these things. And Zimbabwe is unfortunately one of the markets that we really don't feel comfortable investing in today because the policy there is still so unconventional. Yeah. And Farouk, let me ask you, the MENA markets, different, but in 2008, particularly you think of Abu Dhabi and Dubai in particular, there was this massive boom and then sort of changed significantly thereafter and would love your perspective from being around there then. I had moved to the region just after that, but what I will talk about or focus on is the amazing development between 09 and 19, the period I was there. So in 09, Saudi, where I lived, and even Dubai, Abu Dhabi, were very much similar to Africa, off benchmark, no one's really focusing on those areas. And fast forward 10 years, all of those markets became upgraded into the EM benchmark. Saudi Aramco got listed at one point it was the largest listed company in the world and a lot of social reform as well. So for me, in some ways, what happened to the MENA region is what I hope will happen to Africa. And I'd love it to happen in 10 years because I think usually it takes a lot longer. In those 10 years, there's significant social as well as economic transformation. And essentially, the region became mainstream, whereas today Africa is far from mainstream and I guess our attempt with All Africa Partners is to help in that transition to allow more people to look into Africa, help the education part as well of, of the African journey. So if we circle back, you both came from Blakeney, which I guess back to the mid-90s was one of the first large institutional asset managers in the region. would love to hear what's happened over that 25-year period with the markets in Africa. So 2002 onwards, is where institutional money could really be deployed properly into Africa. Between 2002 and 2020, um, the two decades overall, despite the last five years being quite difficult, it's been a reasonable period. So the market as a whole, if you just took the beta, the 250 names that we're looking at, um, the market grew at 7, 8, 9% um, in terms of market cap. So despite five years of very difficult performance, 2015 to 2019, 2020, 8% is not a bad USD number. And where are we today? So today, the universe as a whole, so all African stocks, is around 1,200 names. At the beginning of that two-decade period, it's probably half. The opportunity set, so when we exclude small caps and we exclude commodities, today there's around 260 names. In the early 2002s, there's about 100 names. So in terms of names, not significant growth, but when you look at market cap, and more importantly, profitability, the USD growth has been very reasonable. And again, a number to focus on today, our opportunity set is just under $500 billion. So it's been a two decade period where overall the high level number is decent. And it's, a, I guess, a game of two halves. 2002 to 15 was where the market cap CAGA, the net profit CAGA was double. So instead of 7 8% mid-teens, 15 to 19, 15 to 20, very similar to the rest of EM, you are flat to down. And obviously what we are betting our hopes on is that you have seen an inflection point post-19. Post-19, there was COVID, a lot of noise, but definitely this year is the first year in many that you've had outperformance by Africa. And very importantly to us, the bottom line continues to grow. The jaws are widening, but the bottom line continues to grow at 8%, 10%, 12% plus. So Colin, you mentioned at the onset that you don't invest in Zimbabwe. Africa is made of lots of countries. How do you decide where you will invest or where you won't? We always think it's rather ironic that Africa, which has more countries than any other continent, is also the place that's usually seen as a single country. (laughs) There are 54 countries in Africa we can invest in about 20 of those. So 20 of those have stock exchanges 
that are big enough for us to invest in. South Africa is a very, very big part of that, about 60% in terms of number of names as well as market cap. And then you've got a number of single stock countries, Ghana, Malawi, Botswana, where the, you know, the liquidity and the size of the opportunities mean there are not many. Out of the 20 countries that we look at, there are 16 currencies. And obviously, naturally, we're going to gravitate towards those countries where there are more opportunities. So in our case, South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Nigeria, or quite big exchanges. And then the next tier down will be the likes of Kenya. And those are the, the sort of mainstays of our portfolio. In terms of picking countries, I mentioned we didn't invest in Zimbabwe at the moment. And that's really on the basis of liquidity. Because we're investing in listed markets and we promise to give money back to our investors if they ask for it back, we need to be confident that we can take that money out of these markets. So, you know, the availability of US dollars, the underlying liquidity, not just at the portfolio level, but the underlying liquidity of every single position that we invest in is something we care very deeply about. In Zimbabwe at the moment, unfortunately, we don't feel like we can get the money out. I'd love to hear some examples of companies in your portfolio that you're excited about. Well, maybe I can start talking about Equity Group in Kenya. So Equity Group is the largest bank in Kenya, but also in the rest of East Africa. It started as a listed entity around 20 years ago. And since then, it has grown its dollar EPS by over 20% per annum. That's the CAGA for the company. It's just a phenomenal business that really started off as almost a micro lender to the unbanked in Kenya. The CEO, James Mwangi, who has taken it through this entire period over the last 20 years, said he really wanted to create a bank for his mother, uh, who is unbanked, right? And as Equity Group began on that journey, so they've grown with those people. And now it's a full service bank where half of the business is corporates and SMEs. The really exciting bit about Equity Group, which we think people misunderstand, is that they've recently expanded into the DRC the Democratic Republic of Congo. To give you a sense of scale, the Democratic Republic of Congo is about a 90 million population economy, about twice the size of the Kenyan population. And about 80% of those people are unbanked. So actually, it looks a whole lot like Kenya did 20 years ago. It's just roughly twice the size. You can buy Equity Group today, a little over a billion dollars for the entire company. You can buy it today at about half the price that you could in 2015. And you're getting all of that DRC opportunity for free. We think that's a total no-brainer for a company that has consistently executed over 20 years. Its ROEs have been 20 to 30% very, very consistently. They managed their way through COVID incredibly well. We just love the company. We, we love the opportunity. I'll tell you, leave you with one other fact about that, which is many people think that Banks are all about bricks and mortar and all that. that. That is not the case in Africa and is not the case with equity groups. So they were very, very quick to adopt all sorts of technology over time to the point now where 98% of their transactions are electronic transactions that happen away from any sort of bank branch. This is happening not just on phones, but also on mobile apps, the internet, all sorts of ways. So it's a really phenomenal business very, very profitable bank. And you know we're delighted to be shareholders. I'll maybe talk about MTN Nigeria. Telecoms in Africa in many ways is the holy grail for telecom investors. Uh, why? Because you you still have voice growing at 8, 9, 10%. So voice is still high single digit growth. You have data growing at 20%. And then you have this unique component, which is mobile money, essentially a replacement for banks growing at 30% plus. And it's a well-trodden path. I mean, there's a lot of companies who have who are at different stages of this journey. So Safaricom in Kenya is probably the most mature firm where mobile money is a third or more of their top line. MTN Nigeria is in many ways just getting started. So only a few months ago, they got the mobile money license. So today, mobile money is essentially 0% of their revenue and is still being largely driven by voice and data. In many ways, it's a classic African story in that the demographics are important. So Nigeria is 200 million plus people. Why do we like MTN Nigeria? Number one, telecoms is a place where you want to really stick with the largest player. So they're the by far the most dominant telecom player in Nigeria, 50% and above market share. And there's a lot of economies of scale and network effects that come with being the largest. Number two, they're actually a subsidiary of an even larger group, the MTN group of South Africa. So there's a lot of significant 
let's say, procurement benefits or balance sheet benefits that come from being part of a larger group. And third is just this significant structural tailwind that as the country gets richer, as the country slowly, slowly gets older, the voice subscribers will adopt data, the data subscribers will adopt mobile money, which leads to 15, 20% revenue and bottom line growth. So it's in many ways the classic African story, but also the classic telecom story because it's been repeated so many times in many other countries. And Ted, you can buy MTN Nigeria for single digit PE. You can buy Equity Group in Kenya for less than book value. Both of them pay a 7% div yield at the moment. <laughs> What's not to like? What's your sense of, of the assessment of the public market opportunity compared to the private market opportunity in Africa? We have to be careful what we say because Miles Morland owns a private equity <laughs> African firm. Um, but for us, again, I mean, it's a very simple equation because we think the opportunity in the public markets is fantastic. Why? Because you get all of the reasons why you're entering Africa, the demographics, the urbanization and so on, but a much, much more attractive valuation. So the valuations PE, you're paying eight times. On the private side, you're paying price to sales eight times for the similar exposure. So you're, you know, the exposure is, let's say, something fintech or something regarding education. So we own an education company. So why would I pay a many times higher multiple on the private side when I can get it on the public? And with the public investment, I have 10, 15 years of track record, 10, 15 years of audited IFRS financials, audited by PwC. I have, you know, all of the transparency, which I don't get in the private sector. So for sure, over the last three years, flavor of the month was VC, flavor of the month was PE. And even within the African context, the PE guys did better, raised more funds because that's what's hot. And before us, it didn't make any sense. You're getting the same exposure, but you're happy to pay more. And I think it's a side tangent maybe, that it seems to be people are more willing to lock up their money. They don't want the day-to-day marking to market, which you get with the public markets. And, you know, you get someone from your board calling you, why is this African public market fund down? Whereas with the privates, you're locked away for seven years and seven years later, I'll figure out, did I make money or not? Yeah, I agree entirely with that. I mean, we, we do not see any evidence that private equity valuations are anything like the discount that they are in the public markets in Africa. If anything, the opposite is true. And actually quite a lot of the private equity firms that we know would have taken advantage of you know, all of the craziness in those markets in recent years in order to exit some positions. But to be clear, we want to see the private equity markets in Africa thriving, and we want to see them sending more businesses to the stock markets, because that's part of the sort of natural development of, of these countries, of their exchanges. You know, African stock markets are still you know, 20 to 25% of GDP, miles behind the rest of the world. You know, China is up at 80, 90%. The US is well over 100. We don't know of anywhere on the planet where you've seen sustained economic growth without growth in the stock markets and the private markets coming in and playing their part in developing good companies is a really important part of that equation. As an extension maybe to your question, Ted, one question we often get asked is, well, if these companies are doing phenomenally well, the public companies, but the valuations are rock bottom, why aren't they going private or being bought out? But we have seen that. So we've seen private equity firms coming to the public markets and picking off the best jewels, which are trading at four times PE, five times PE, and taking them private. So we have seen that materialize over the last few years in Africa. So you have all these metrics that are super exciting with underlying growth, classic empty room, right? People have left the building. What are the risks? Well, I suppose the risks are that if you don't buy it, you you may miss out on the opportunity. (laughs) Seriously, that's the risk. I think, you know, when we think of taking a step back, the broader opportunity in Africa, where else do you have this combination of growing economies, outstanding companies, and really inefficient markets, right? And when we say growing economies, like it's not just one or two examples. If you look at the top 10 or top 20 fastest growing economies in the world, Africa always makes up half of those and has done for many years and is expected to continue to do so. Today, Africa accounts for what, 18, 20% of the global population. By the end of the century, that's going to be 40%. By the end of the century, four in every 10 people are going to be African. And the urbanization story that goes along with that is absolutely colossal. You know, obviously, we've spoken a little bit about FX risk. We know that many of these countries are young democracies, and that comes with sometimes less stable politics than, than other places. But 
really hand on heart, if you look at the private sector, if you look at the way we're doing things, the growth is there. It's been proven over the last 20 years and some. It just happens that in the last five or six years, the market caps have failed to keep pace with that. But we know, what do they say? You know, in the, in the long run, it's a, it's a weighing machine, not a voting machine, right? And we're very, very confident that they're going to keep up with this. I mean, I think a big risk is after hearing some of these numbers that we've mentioned, you know, Africa as a whole, it's a $3 trillion economy, eighth largest equivalent economy in the world, one and a half billion people, the growth that we've mentioned. After hearing all of this, does a 0% weight really reflect the opportunity? The reality is the majority of people are at 0%, and there's a big difference of being zero and having 0.1. Having 0.1% means it's at least on the agenda. Maybe once a year in the investment committee, Africa will be discussed. Having zero means out of sight, out of mind, no one even discusses Africa. But to your question of what's the risk, I think the risk is or was a continuation of the last five years, which is the opportunity cost of investing in Africa is too high. Why? Because the US is doing phenomenally well, UK, Europe. So why should I fix something that's not broken? Why should I um, move money away from my US portfolio or develop market portfolio and take it to Africa? But that only makes sense if you think the last six months of Fed rates increasing and what we've seen around the world is transitory. A lot of people six months ago were saying this whole inflation thing will be over in three months, it'll be over in six months. It's very difficult to find those people anymore. So I think that risk, the opportunity cost of Africa being high has dissipated very aggressively over the last three months. And genuinely, a lot of people are looking for alternatives to the US, are looking for alternatives to Europe. And the US does look a bit broken, markets anyway. You mentioned the importance of liquidity. I'd love to get a sense of what does a liquid stock look like in one of the countries in Africa and what is something that is too illiquid to trade? There is a very, very big spectrum. What we mean by liquidity is we need to have reasonable confidence that we can get out of a position within six months. So obviously we've got a growing fund and you know it's very helpful to have a growing fund at the moment. And so we look at things like ADTV, we look at block trades. Block trades are really important in some of our markets and that obviously doesn't appear in the ADTV figures. And we try to estimate really whether we are confident that looking back over the last year or a different period, if we think it's appropriate, that we can be confident that if we needed to exit this position, we could. Who are the other shareholders? Can we speak to management to find out if there are other buyers? All those sort of factors come into play. We also know that liquidity is ephemeral and usually least available when you most want it. And we have to take all of these numbers with a pinch of salt and it's not a perfect science, but really the finding of liquidity is such an important part of our job and it's something that many other markets don't have. So if we decide today that we want to invest $10 million into equity group in Kenya, um, actually we may have to think about where that $10 million is going to go. Where are we going to find the stock and who are we buying it from and why are they selling it? And do we need to speak to one broker or do we need to speak to multiple brokers? And we need to think about the same on the other end. It also means that deploying the capital is not necessarily a, a one-day job or even a one-month job sometimes. It can take you as long to get into a position fully as it does to get out of a position fully sometimes. So you got to factor all of that in. And what does that imply based on the opportunity set you see about how big you're comfortable growing to in terms of raised capital? Based on today's average daily traded values based on today's liquidity, we think the capacity of the strategy is about a billion dollars. But in terms of net subscriptions, we'd be comfortable taking about half of that. So today it would be around $500 million. And obviously this is a movable target based on markets, based on what's happening on the liquidity side. To contextualize that number, this is probably less than half of the AUM of some of our predecessor firms who are looking at Africa. And partially it's by design because I think some of the firms became too big and partially it's reflective of the current numbers. We don't want to get too big just to gather assets. So it's reflective of both the markets, but also the concentrated style that we're trying to run. What's happened with some of the other institutional owners in this period of time over the last seven or eight years that have been very tough in the markets? Well, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of players have stepped out of the market and the African markets didn't perform particularly well really since 2015, 2015 through 19 the African markets in general underperformed the rest of the world, and in particular the US. 
And, you know, that always creates problems for money managers because not only are they dealing with markets that are falling, but they're also dealing with redemptions as people redeploy that cash elsewhere. And for an already small opportunity set that creates problems for the economics of these firms. Some of the uh, players that are involved, you know, we've got what we think are three of the most outstanding senior advisors in the business. You know, Miles with his connection to Blakeney and DPI, John Niepold with his connection to SQM, which is another billion dollar Africa firm, and uh, Torquil McAlpine, who was the director of the Arisag Africa Fund and obviously a co-founder of Arisag Asia. I'm sure these guys don't mind me saying that they're all at or near retirement age and they were around for a long time. And a lot of these small boutique firms don't survive their founders moving on. So I think in the the annals of history, you know, all of these firms did a terrific job over a sustained period, particularly Blakeney, came to a natural end at an appropriate time. What's happened with the sophistication of the companies in these markets and the opportunity you see at a company by company level from the bottom up? I would say, if anything, despite the markets up and down and despite all of the things that we've said between the last five years, things being tough, the companies have kept delivering. So this is what we have to give credit where it's due that the companies, and in many cases, you know, a lot of the management will say, look, we don't really care about the share price. We're just focused on bottom line, operational delivery and so on. And this is what gives us so much positive vibes about what we're doing that even over the COVID period and over the last five, six, seven years, they've just kept delivering. So the widening jaws in terms of where market cap has been flat to sideways or down and net profitability has kept growing. So sophistication in terms of tech adoption, in terms of tech leapfrogging in many cases. So a lot of the telecom companies that we cover used to be behind telecom firms in the rest of EM or even developed markets and have leapfrogged ahead because of COVID, because of the you know, lack of legacy systems to replace and are probably way ahead in terms of, let's say, mobile money or mobile banking. So on the company side, I think we're very, very happy and comfortable that they are delivering what they're supposed to do. I think I want to say something else about sophistication, if I may, and, and maybe this is a bit broader than what you were asking, Ted, but I think many people who don't know Africa hugely underappreciate just how sophisticated and mainstream these companies are. I think most people would be surprised that eight out of the 10 CEOs of the companies in which we invest in today were educated in either Europe or, or the US. I think people would be surprised that in all 20 of the exchanges that we invest in, IFRS is standard and required. I think people would be surprised that auditors have to be changed every five years. You know, when you look at these financial reports, you look at the quality of governance, Africa is miles ahead of many other parts of uh, certainly emerging and frontier markets, in part because of the legacy of colonial French and English legal systems, the fact that business is conducted largely in English. So the sophistication, the, the quality of management for us is very rarely the reason why we're not investing in something. These are really outstanding people running these companies. So you've kind of alluded to, Farouk, that the companies have delivered, but share prices maybe haven't been as strong. I'd love to hear just at an aggregate level, what are some of the basic financial metrics that might get people excited looking at Africa? In terms of earnings growth, so as I mentioned, over the long period, it's been kind of high single digit to low double digit USD growth. And USD, we, we emphasize USD because that's what majority of our clients and majority of people are looking at. Obviously, on a local currency basis, it's significantly higher. In terms of the portfolio, so our 10-stock portfolio, the current ROE is 33%. In terms of dividend yield, we're talking about 8 9% dividend yield. And again, the yield, often follow-up question is, well, why are they paying out so much? The yield is high because the price is so low. The payout ratio isn't necessarily super high. And in terms of, again, valuations, the PE of the portfolio is today at 8 9 times PE. A lot of the names that we're looking at because of the valuations are market leading companies. So when you look at market shares, margins are leading because of the scale benefit. You know, in telecoms, if you're the largest company, most likely you have the strongest balance sheet, you have the benefits of scale, and your margin will more often than not be higher than some of your peers. So on financial metrics, it's in line, if not better, with a lot of the EM and even DM peers. But what's not followed through, as you've said, is, is the market cap. And I think this is not really Africa-specific, maybe more symptomatic of EM as a whole. Basically, Ted, our portfolio trades at half the price and triple the yield of Acqui. What's not to get excited about there? 
how does the those metrics of your portfolio compare to something if somebody was buying an index, Africa index, what would that look like? The first thing is there aren't many appropriate Africa indexes. So they, they do exist, but they're often skewed by whether they include South Africa or not. And if they do include South Africa, what weighting is it? And does that include NASPERS? But one of the metrics that we like to explain to people in quite a lot of detail is it's not a surprise that our portfolio trades at a discount to the rest of the world. Nobody would be surprised by that. The discount has widened since COVID, which is interesting. But to us, the most important aspect of the margin of safety is that these companies trade at a discount to their own last 10-year valuations. So if you just look at the median valuations that these portfolio companies have traded at, either since they listed, if it's within the last 10 years or going into the last 10 years, the discount is substantial. If our portfolio today just re-rated to their own historic valuations, would be up over 50% in dollar terms. So these things are really trading at crazy valuations, even by their own standards. How do you handle the currency? It's a great question. How long do we have, right? <laughs> um, so currency is really important. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there are 16 currencies that we have to deal with. Some of those are pegged. Some of those are pegged to baskets. Some of them are pegged to the dollar. And then there are some like Nigeria, which is sort of quasi-pegged. And, and that's a peg that's managed in a bit of an unconventional way. The most important thing for us, the starting point, is that if we look at any of our floating currencies over a 20-year period, the inflation differential to the U.S. perfectly explains the depreciation. The shorter you make that period, the more noise there is in that relationship, right? And obviously, at the moment, there's so much noise, we can't hear ourselves. So we know that the inflation differential looking forward ought to be the key metric that determines the discount rate. It means that a historically low inflation economy like Kenya or South Africa uh, should see less depreciation than a higher inflation economy like uh, Ghana or Nigeria. And those things are really important for us to understand because when we're making investment decisions, we need to decide between a bank in Egypt and a telco in Nigeria and a brewer in Kenya. And we need to be able to have figures that really are in USD. And so we look at the inflation differential and then we look at other factors that may hint at a buildup of a problem. And that could be a high real effective exchange rate. It could be the increasing prevalence of a black market rate. It could be that the country is very exposed to something that is unusually highly priced at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of that in the, in the global economy right now. So we look at all of those factors and then we may add to the discount every year if we think that the inflation differential is alongside some of these other red flags. And then we'll apply that, that appropriate country discount to every company that we look at there. So we end up with US dollar valuations that are comparable across our opportunity set. How has the rising inflation in the U.S. And, and much of the rest of the development world followed through in Africa? There's a lag. Some of our countries have inflation levels lower than the U.S. and the U.K., which I can't remember the last time that was the case. So there's definitely a lag. And why? Because some countries import less or more self-sufficient. Other countries are less self-sufficient. But this is a pressure point for our countries. And this is a reason why some of the currencies, to Colin's point, have been under pressure year to date. Um, so in some of our markets, we are being quite punitive in terms of the depreciations that we're forecasting because there's a balance of payments issue because there's a bit of a gray market which has been built up in terms of the official FX rate versus the unofficial FX rate. So it's something that we are tracking. But again, to our earlier point that not by design perhaps, but the majority of the companies that we own today are distant market leaders within their sectors. So in this period, what we really care about is pricing power. For example, do the companies that we own have pricing power? So even if it's an inflation environment, because of the strength of their brand, because of pricing power, they will lead the way, increase prices, and the impact on volumes will be much smaller than peers. Or because they are market leaders, it's in a survival of the fittest. The number two, number three, number four player may well fold because they don't have the balance sheet. So the number one player will take the market share. So we are well positioned for the macro environment that we find ourselves in. There's something else there which is really important to mention, which is that our economies are not particularly well correlated to anything else. Many people that are investing with us are doing it because it's diversification in their portfolio. So although we run a very concentrated portfolio, we add diversification because, frankly, 
what happens in the Kenyan economy is not particularly well correlated with what happens to the US. And obviously, we look at the inflation figures because of the impact on currencies. But actually, at the moment, the world is not necessarily integrating any further at the moment. If anything, people are taking a bit of a step back. And we think that's going to make places like Africa even less correlated with the US markets. And that's certainly one of the reasons why our investors are on board. I'd love to dive in some more of your investment approach. So you've talked a little bit about the number of companies and the number you see in your universe. How do you get from one to the other? So as mentioned, the opportunity set is around 250. So this is just a basic filter, avoid commodities, avoid the small caps. And then from the 250, we have something called the All Africa list, which is around 40 names. So quite a big filtering system there. And that essentially is a quality filter. Both Colin and I are very old school, value, bottom up, fundamental guys. And we're looking a lot at qualitative factors. So things like the quality of the management, the track record of the company, what's the sustainable and importantly defendable moat of the business. And often this analysis is not just months, it's years of interactions with the management, years of traveling to the country, Post-COVID, I think we've had six or seven in-country visits already. Through this accumulation of historic work and also some of the legacy things that we benefit from our advisors, we'll narrow it down to the best 40 on a quality basis. And whenever we are looking to introduce a name into this 40, it will have to be approved by all of the team. And importantly, Ted, the 40 is a one-in, one-out list. So it's constrained to 40A because this is twice the number of the maximum number of positions we could have. So max number of positions is 20. Having 2x that as the pool seems reasonable. And at any given time, let's say we have 40 names and there's an interesting new IPO, something has to be booted out. And the rationale of that is the most important decision within the firm is allocation of time. We all have 24 hours in the day. And for us, the worst thing possible would be one of the team on the side kind of working away for weeks and weeks on a financial model and then brings it to the team and none of us like it and there's emotional biases and fights and so we want to avoid all of that and hence it's a one in one out and the team has to agree on what's booted out as well as brought in and that's where we get to the 40. Colin if you want to carry on the journey from the 40 to the 20 maybe. We build these US dollar IRRs and part of the reason for doing that is because we don't want to make qualitative subjective judgments later down the line so Once we've got 40 of the best companies or what we think are the best companies in our opportunity, so we want to have valuations for them that are comparable. And ideally, we want to build a portfolio that has 10 to 20 of the highest IRRs within that list of 40. Now, obviously, there are some reasons why you wouldn't necessarily just take the top 10 or 20 in the IRR. For example, liquidity, which we've mentioned, Uh, you might have a country cap or we also look at things like what we call the quality of the IRR. We much prefer businesses where the majority of the returns are being driven by underlying growth and dividends and less so by multiple re-rates. Those things come into play, but really what we're doing is once we determine the 40, we create valuations for them and we want to get the best out of those. There are some other constraints that we put on ourselves about what kind of IRR we're trying to generate for the portfolio as a whole. But all of those are sort of common sense things. What's different about the diligence process with a company in Africa than someone who's doing this in developed markets? The really, really big difference is that these companies are not covered by research houses, by sell side. Out of our opportunity set, a third has zero analyst coverage whatsoever. And many of the companies just have one or two names that are covering them. And maybe those people might update their recommendation on this company once a year or something. And you know, often it'll be junior people that do it. And So that's the really, really big difference. Yes, we can get full bells and whistles public reporting by the companies, which is generally excellent. We can get access to management, which is obviously very, very important. When we're running a concentrated portfolio, we really want to know the companies. We really want to understand the businesses. We want to understand the people. And so in the absence of lots of other people doing research, we get out there and do it ourselves. So far this year, even with all of the restrictions and thankfully the world now opening up again, but we've already been to South Africa, we've been to Ghana, we've been to Egypt, and we're probably going to go other places as well before the end of the year, just to get on the ground, speak to companies, speak to competitors. When we invest in supermarkets, you walk around the supermarket, you know, what does it feel like? Go and meet the telecoms regulator. What do they think about the company that you're investing in? Uh, You know, are they on good terms? So it's a lot of really on the ground, deep dive research. I guess this is the source of the inefficiency. I mean, this is why Africa is a active manager's dream, because you have this dislocation between 
underlying profitability and how the market is rewarding, or in this case, not rewarding the companies because of lack of uh, sell side coverage. So even for the gem manager, often the armchair Africa investors, as I like to call them, they might look at South Africa, they might look at one or two names in Egypt or elsewhere, but they don't have time to go any any deeper. And you know, to further expand Colin's point, a lot of African names used to be covered and then got dropped because of you know, the last four or five years and generally Wall Street and sell side being under pressure and letting go of people. So Africa has been a victim of that, but it's the source of the inefficiency of the markets. How do you find doing this work from London compared to sitting in Africa when so much of that qualitative diligence you've talked about is being on the ground you know, with the companies? We think London is a tremendous place to be because it's a really, really easy point to visit all of our companies from. It's in essentially the same time zone. We're at most two hours away from any of our companies in terms of time zone. And, you know, even if we went and sat in Cape Town or Nairobi or Lagos, we would always still have to go and visit other companies. So it's good to be in a place where we can have easy access by air to both our companies as well as to our investors who, you know, are not just based here in the US, but also in the UK and mainland Europe. How do you go about making the decision of what gets added to the All Africa list? It's qualitative and quality driven. So there might be a candidate which has been recently IPO'd or a company that we think has kind of turned around. And essentially, there'll be a lead analyst on any name. It'd be for that lead analyst to compile his potential All Africa list document and try and convince the other guys, A, on its own right, it's a high quality name. And then B, it deserves a space. So at one point, it will become a kind of head-to-head battle between the prospective promoted name and which one is the candidate to be demoted. The names that are in the 40 already in the list are of a higher quality, of a higher caliber, and therefore that company has to wait. And the turnover in terms of the All Africa list is, is relatively limited. So in any given year, maybe three, four, five names may come in and out. But primarily it's because of delistings and listings. Why? Because, you know, quality is something that we track over many years and quality is something which is usually, not always, but usually difficult to destroy over six months. And if a company has been high quality for a while, it's in the list, it would be very difficult for for us then overnight to think, look, it's not a high quality company anymore. It needs to be booted out. What have you learned from comparing those decisions just on the All Africa list of companies you've added, ones you've excluded, and what's happened with their share price performance thereafter? One of the really key things we've learned is that the decision to pursue work on a particular company is usually done with an idea of what you think the valuation is before you've done the valuation. We're trying really, really hard not to make that mistake. We want to own companies where we're happy to put the share certificate in the drawer for five years if we have to and not really think about it. Transaction costs are high in many parts of Africa. These things can be volatile, all the liquidity issues that we've spoken about. We don't want to have to buy bad quality companies and get the timing right. We don't think we're smart enough for that. We don't think the markets are liquid enough for that. So we're trying really, really hard to not make subconscious and certainly not conscious decisions about valuation. When you see the PE, you see the market cap, you look at the stock price chart over the last year, and then you do your all Africa list work. No, like it's it's definitely something different to that. I hope we have a lot of problems in getting companies onto and off that list in future, because if we have a lot of problems, it means we have more quality companies than we thought we had before. How do you go about the process of executing trades? Well, we have an outstanding uh, operations manager, Saunders Youssef, who also joined us from Blakeney. And she is a real whiz in this and does a lot of the heavy lifting on the on the execution side of things. So Farouk and I make the decisions to invest in a company. Say we have a target weight of 10%, say, in a particular company. We will then give that instruction to Saunders and she will go off and try to source the stocks. So that could be a quick conversation with one broker or it could be a painful conversation with 10 brokers over many moons. Sometimes we have to get involved. Sometimes we have to call up the management team, you know, see if we can source some blocks from, from somewhere else. Sometimes we're speaking to other fund managers who may be exiting or maybe buying alongside you and you're trying to sort of negotiate a better price or negotiate a bigger share of, of a block that's being sold. There's a lot of legwork that goes into it and very few of the trades are just as simple as going to your online account and plugging in a number and pressing go. 
What do you see in the composition of the shareholder base alongside of you, generally in the names in your portfolio? I think it's hard to generalize. Um, South Africa, obviously, is a much more developed market than Ghana or Egypt. So South Africa would be a more typical US or UK style shareholder list. So often the pension funds are the largest, the big asset management firms are also in the top three, top five, top seven. It's a very institutional heavy shareholder list. Whereas when you start going to perhaps Egypt and Kenya or even Morocco, a lot of the large holders are the founding families because it's early on in the development of those markets. And again, both have their pros and cons. Generally, we do like companies where the management team are part of the founding family and they still own 20, 30, 40% because of the alignment of incentives and interests. So it does differ. And I think the South Africa and non-South Africa comparison is is the kind of easy one in terms of institutionals and non-institutional mix. When you have 10 to 20 stocks in your portfolio, how do you think about portfolio construction? Well, it's sort of relatively simple with a 10 stock uh, portfolio, right? In a sense, we don't have to think very much. You asked earlier about countries and how we think about countries. We don't tend to do a lot of thinking about the top down. We're much more sort of fundamental focus. But we do think about countries that are on an upswing. We prefer to look at things that have been a bit beaten up, a bit out of favor. We tend to have that sort of value bias. And the same is true of countries. So If you take South Africa and Nigeria at the moment, for example, both of those countries have been out of favor for different reasons over that 2015 to 19 period. Different reasons, but good reasons. We think both of those have very clear positive momentum and positive catalysts on the horizon. So we're going to spend a bit more time looking for opportunities in those countries than we would in places that have been good for a long time. That, to a certain extent, informs where we work day to day and obviously If you're doing a valuation on company A, you're more likely to make a decision on it than the company that you're not doing any work on. So part of it is dictated by how we decide to allocate our time. But really what we're looking for is we want to get the highest conviction ideas into the portfolio. After that, we have a 30% country limit in the portfolio. When we look at the real risks that we're exposed to, that are difficult for us to mitigate against. It's really the country risks, the FX risks that we have to be really careful about. And those are risks over which we have no control. We know that inter-country correlation is much, much higher than sector correlation across Africa, for example. So we have a 30% country limit. We don't have a sector limit though. So we're quite happily own 50% in a sector if we really like the sector, we really like the story, we feel there's enough companies that, that represent that, but we'll limit ourselves on the country. When you look at the different sectors of opportunity, what are you looking to invest in I would say, I mean, commodities is the only one where we explicitly avoid and everything else is game. Everything else is open to investments. But we do maybe have a bias towards areas or sectors which are exposed to the big themes in Africa. So namely the rising middle class, the increasing working age population, urbanization. So these are the big themes which any African investor is exposed to. And by sector, it means a lot of the consumer facing sectors, so be it education, healthcare, FMCG, food, are areas which a lot of our potential ideas come up from. But also the kind of stereotypical sectors, which is the banks and the brewers and the cements, less so, but they are still there. Commodities are the only one that we rule out and everything else we're open to. And maybe just to expand further, in terms of the mechanical process of portfolio construction, the starting point would be the 40 names in our All Africa list and the IRRs rank from highest to lowest. And that's the starting point of the conversation and everything else being equal, perhaps, you would be surprised if we have a lot of names which are bottom quartile IRR and not many names top quartile. So the starting point would be you should be owning most of the top or second quartile. And then the discussion, as Colin mentioned, would go into the quality of the IRR. If there's two companies with the same IRR, but one is primarily driven by multiple re-rate, the other isn't, you'd prefer one over the other. And then the filters regarding country exposures, et cetera, would come secondarily post that initial conversation. But the starting point is that we have faith in our work, we have faith in the models and the assumptions we're making to rank the IRRs. And that is your initial place regarding the weightings and the positions that you have. So you mentioned that some of the backers of your fund have been some of the most influential institutional investors in the region for a long time. I'd love to hear what you feel you're doing similarly and differently from some of them and why. 
I think that's a great question. And, and we have quite a lot of differences, actually, in, in how we're operating to all of those three predecessor firms, Blakeney, SQM, and Arasig, Africa. I'd say the biggest difference to Blakeney is the concentration piece. And the fact that we have a 10, 15 stock portfolio is very, very different to Blakeney's approach, which was really when we joined, they had about 60 positions in the portfolio. It's very difficult to generate alpha from a 250 stock portfolio if you have 60 positions. One of the other differences is around privates. When these managers got going, actually the private markets in Africa really didn't exist at all. So it made sense for them to have 10, 20% allocation into private equity. Invariably, those were where real problems came for the firm because you know trying to mix privates into a liquid portfolio creates liquidity issues, oversight issues, etc. So we will never do that. If you want a private investment, we can make a recommendation, but that's not our gig. I say one of the other differences is Arasaig Africa was focused exclusively on consumer companies, and they had quite a narrow description of, of what consumer meant. I think it was something like eat it, wear it, drink it, or something like that was their catchphrase. We have a broader interpretation of what exposure to the growth story in Africa means from a consumer perspective. We think the the demographic, the urbanization story in Africa is really what is by far the most attractive aspect beyond valuation of the opportunity in Africa. And you can get exposure to that through cement makers and banks and brewers and mobile money players, telcos, etc., much more broadly than you can just focusing narrowly on consumer names. So that was a difference. And then I'd say with SQM, one of the differences was they were very, very happy to take positions in much less liquid companies. So they had a broader range of countries and companies in their portfolio, but you know had to take some liquidity pain as a consequence of that. So there are some clear differences. I would also add we are definitely standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, we're avoiding and making sure we don't do these things, but there's lots of things we're happy to copy. Blakeney, in the grand scheme of things, was a phenomenally successful business, three decades running these funds, three decades of a very niche product in Africa, Middle East. If we're around in three decades' time, you know, phenomenal success. So Blakeney, SQM, and RSA Africa did many, many things right, and we're trying to emulate those parts. And obviously, in certain areas, we're different because it's a different context, different time. As Colin said, some things that Blakeney did in the late 90s, early 2000s made sense then, but doesn't make sense today, like the privates. We obviously have the benefit of seeing all of Miles Morland's notes going back over the 30 years and stuff. And I would say the company that we've created now is much, much more similar to Blakeney in its early days than Blakeney towards the end. So if I have you guys back on the show, say, three years from now, and something has gone badly wrong, what do you think it would be? Maybe we get wrong on one of the big countries or something like that, or maybe the dollar strength continues to be what it is. We think that probably that will unwind at some point, and I would assume it will unwind in less than three years, but it may not. If that weren't to unwind, that would continue to be a very significant headwind for our countries, particularly the commodity importers, the oil importers, who obviously, as well as oil price being high at the moment, they're also struggling with the very high dollar that it's denominated in, which is a bit of a double whammy. So I think, you know, that a very strong dollar for many years to come, I think would be problematic for our market. So it's just a continuation of my previous point that for whatever reason, the market does not reward the continuous dollar bottom line growth, free cash flow growth, dividend yield. So there's some external reason and the opportunity cost of coming into Africa is too high. Why? Because India looks more attractive or Russia comes back into the norm and China is fine again. And therefore, why should I go to Africa when I can get better risk adjusted reward elsewhere? For Africa itself not to work because of that internal reason, I think would be would be difficult to see. I want to make another sort of more general point, Ted, on, on risk. In, in our experience, people's perception of risks in Africa is very different to their perception of risk elsewhere. A lot of people say to us, well, we couldn't possibly invest in Africa because that's a really dangerous place. Like, well, gee, did you not invest in New York in the 1980s and 1990s, right? There's this perception that Africa are full of sort of diseased people living in mud huts and, you know, lack sophistication and can't speak for themselves and stuff like that. It just ain't true. Another one we hear is, oh, you know, there's terrible terrorism happening in Mozambique. And that's true. And it is terrible, but it really doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect our portfolio. And people happily invest in South Korea 
despite it being right next door to North Korea. And yet they might use the excuse of issues in Mozambique to prevent an investment in South Africa. These are totally different countries. And I think there is still, unfortunately, as Miles Morland would say, you know, the sort of Bob Geldof Bono influence on the world, right? It's the perception of Africa as this basket case is is still a very, very real threat. And it's going to take time to overcome that. And that may not have been overcome in three years. So given the excitement of the opportunity set, why do you think so many of the largest institutional investors in the public markets in Africa have shut down over the last couple of years? The opportunity cost of not investing in the US from 2015 to 19 was great. The other thing which you haven't spoken about is in 2015, the valuations for our companies were high. When we talk about the discount to historic valuations for our companies today, that wasn't the case in 2015. In 2015, they were expensive relative to their own history. So again, it was probably the right time to pull back because there is so little capital there for a little bit of capital to pull back usually means firms go bust in a way that isn't necessarily true for other parts of the world. But although there aren't a lot of people investing in Africa today, we know of some of the most successful of the large endowments and foundations in the US today have very significant exposure to Africa and are achieving very good performance in those markets. Well, Colin Farouk, I want to make sure I asked you a couple of closing questions before I let you go. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Well, Farouk uh, is going to laugh at this, and I'm sure you will as well, Ted. But mine is actually woodworking at the moment. I mean, I love running. I love sport. And, uh, you know, that's very much in my DNA, given the rowing background. But I really love woodworking. It's something I inherited from my father. What about it? I don't have to think too much about it. I can do it standing up. I can <laughs> I can be in the, in the garage, in the man cave. And I really enjoy sort of building real things. And I'm not particularly good at it, to be clear. <laughs> so, um, uh, it's really nice to do something where you can improve quite quickly because you're that bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> For myself, unfortunately, it'll be a stereotypical response, which is football, soccer. So since growing up until now, I play once, twice a week. My knees are not as strong as they used to be, so obviously it hurts much more. Um, but I, I watch soccer, I play soccer, I love everything about it, the team component, the obviously fitness, mental, physical, so it's soccer for me. So Colin, you take a step back and hear about a silver medal in the Olympics, and it sounds like the super impressive thing, but when we watch live sports, you always think about the winner. So I just have to ask, what was that experience like for you coming in second? Well, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, sometimes when people say to me, well, wow, you've got an Olympic medal, I say, oh, remind them, look, you know, I came second just to manage expectations. You know, <laughs> But, you know, it was a really weird moment for us being on the podium in Beijing in 2008 because we wanted to win. We set out to win the race. And in that moment, we were incredibly disappointed not to have won. And I think it was a fair result, to be clear. You know, I didn't think we were going to spend the rest of our lives beating ourselves up about it. But we set out to win and, and we came second. And, and in the moment, it was incredibly disappointing. But it was also an incredibly proud moment. Uh, obviously, you know you're achieving something really special. So I say to people who look for about five days of the year, it really, really annoys me that we came second. And for the other 360, I'm sort of delighted with the achievement. And I think it's one of the coolest things I've ever been able to do. Farouk, what's your biggest pet peeve? Lazy people, basically. Um, I would say people who do not have the work ethic that, not, not necessarily what I expect, but what would be generally expected in any professional or personal capacity just really just winds me up. Um, in any context, you might be super smart, you might have a natural talent, but you need to put in the hours, you need to put in the work to become even better. I'm, so, I'm sure Colin had a natural talent at rowing, but without the effort, without the hours, he wouldn't have become an Olympic rower. Colin? For me, it's, uh, it's cell phones. Uh, cell phones on a table, if you're eating, <laughs> the noise of cell phones, particularly people that are looking at screens and have the beeper on at the same time. <laughs> but you can see it, right? I just turn that, turn it down. <laughs> so yeah, cell phones on tables is a real pet peeve. And how about on the investment side, Colin, investment pet peeve? I have a fairly long list of this, but I think in the context of Africa, I'd say for me and probably for us, it's reporting in local currency without reporting in dollars as well. That can be extremely misleading in high inflation environments. And I really think that that shouldn't be allowed, basically. I think for myself, Ted, it would be people who maybe overcompensate by overcomplicating a model or overdoing it and you know, having a seven-factor model when actually 
one or two factors is probably more than enough. So it really, again, winds me up when someone's trying to convince you they're right because their model is super complicated and actually it's inverse. You reach that peak point and then it's all inversely related. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? One is Peter Lynch. One Up on Wall Street was probably the first proper investment book I read when I was, I think, a teenager and really opened up the door or this universe of investing to me. And then subsequent to that, obviously, Howard Marks, Buffett, etc. But Peter Lynch and One Up on Wall Street uh, was a big one. And the second one I would say is, again, maybe cliched, is my wife, because I have four young kids at home. I have a very chaotic house. But without her, I would not have been able to invest as much in my career, invest as much in all Africa partners, do all these trips. We spend a lot of time on the road. So any of my limited development I've had in, in my professional world would not have been possible without my wife. And that puts pressure on me to say <laughs> my wife. No. <laughs> I'd say for me, I'm going to open with Charlie Munger. I mean, I just think he's just an incredible communicator and I love the way he thinks and very direct uh, style. I've read a lot of stuff he's written. I've exchanged a, a couple of letters with him. I mean, it's really tremendous. Second is Miles Morland, right? I think in terms of direct impact, I don't think anybody really comes close to him. You know, Miles Morland rode in the Oxford Cambridge boat race in 1965. He was president then. I was president in 2009. And he came up to me after I gave my president's speech in 2009. He said, you're African, we need to have lunch. And so began this sort of extraordinary friendship and professional relationship. We've done a lot of things together. All Africa is one of them. And I think he's just a wonderful, wonderful communicator. His letters to investors over the years are, are famous. But I also think he's a tremendous advocate for responsible investing in Africa. He's a tremendous advocate for Africans being treated equally and fairly and being respected and not being told what to do and how to run their lives, which all of us in the rest of the world have been guilty of at certain times. And and he's really, really good at what he does. Um, so he's a tremendous advisor to have on board. Yeah. Colin, what type of investment do you gravitate to like a moth to the flame? I really love sort of traditional value stuff, yeah, particularly in the consumer plays. But give me something that looks really, really beaten up, particularly if it has you know, a good brand attached to it and it sells products in a simple business model. And I'm going to lap that up every day. <laughs> Peru? Recently, it's much more of the kind of on the tech side, these software as a service, asset light type companies. Why? Because it's completely revolutionized the way you can take over the world. I mean, back in the day, if you want to have global domination, you need to build a factory in Australia, a factory in India. And But with these kind of asset light tech businesses, you could be in a small office in New York and have complete domination throughout the world and have 90% market share, but very limited capex outlay in India or in Australia or whatever. So it's completely changed the way you can take over the world. We don't have many opportunities like that in, in Africa. Hopefully we do, but that's really fascinating for me. Kirk, what teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I would say, I mean, maybe not a direct teaching, but I would say it's kind of being brave, being fearless. Um, so my parents were subsistence farmers in Bangladesh before they moved to the UK as economic migrants. And for me, when I think back, moving from a very developing country in the 1960s, 70s, Bangladesh to the UK must have been a very, very scary decision to make. But they were brave, they were fearless, they kind of jumped on and the rest is history. So it's not an explicit teaching, but I think that's always resonated with me that if you want to achieve anything in life, you can't play it safe. You've got to take bets. You've got to be brave. And often, yes, things don't work, but they're learning points. And I think this is one area, unfortunately, the UK culture isn't great. And the US culture is completely opposite. In the US, it's a badge of honor. I've tried three businesses. They didn't work. I'm on to my fourth. I've got lots to learn. But in the UK, it's a bit opposite. But I think, yeah, that's a big learning for me from my parents. Yeah. Colin? Yeah, for me, I mean, beyond uh, the, the woodwork, I mean, there, there, are, there are many <laughs> things. But the one that has really stuck with me, my father often used to use the phrase, we'll, we'll make a plan. And he would use that when he came across a problem that he didn't have a solution for straight away. And to be clear, it wasn't just him who used this phrase. He used it, he loved it a lot. But it was really a very common phrase for his generation in Zimbabwe and South Africa in particular, maybe something to do with the sort of economic environment that those countries went through in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But it was this idea that you could be comfortable knowing that you faced an issue and you didn't yet have a solution and you know, we'll figure it out. You know, We'll make a plan. That's really stuck with me. And I like to think that I and we as all Africa are pretty good at that as well. All right, Colin, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? 
This is a relatively easy one for me, which is uh, start. Starting a difficult task is almost always the hardest part, whether it's a really big, challenging project that you have to do or a difficult training session or a difficult conversation that you need to have with somebody. Starting is almost always the hardest bit. So just get going, make a start, and you'll get through it more easily than you think. I would say it's being open to asking for help. I think often it's we're, we're taught as we're growing up, asking for help is a sign of weakness. But what I've realized in life is, no, it's not, A. And then B, being surrounded by people who you can ask for help. So what, what does that mean? That means being surrounded by people who in many ways are better than you in certain traits. And again, the, the norm is you want to surround yourself with people where you're the best, you're the better than them in X, Y, Z. So I think that's a big, big thing for me that surround yourself with good people, honest people who you can ask for help. And you have that kind of transparent relationship where there's nothing to be ashamed of in terms of asking for help. Farouk, Colin, thanks so much for sharing information about this empty room in Africa. Thanks a lot, Ted. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. 